winters can be pretty long here in Pennsylvania, and I'm looking forward to the spring and summer weather. To get inspiration for some spring, Easter, and summer crafts, I've gathered up 10 of my favorite projects that I've done in the past, and I put them all into one video. I'm really excited to share these with you. I hope you are too. Let's get started. This planter really caught my eye and I knew I only needed a few things from the Dollar Tree to recreate it. I grabbed one planter from the Dollar Tree and I also grabbed two of these luau or hula skirts that I found in the summer section. I started by taping one end of the skirt down on my work surface and you can see that there's about four strings per knot at the top of each string. So they knotted some of this raffia type material around the rope and I just sectioned off three of them and I started braiding down the length of the luau skirt. I went the whole way across the skirt. I wasn't sure if I needed one skirt or two skirts, but as it turned out, my planter was pretty large. So I did need two of the skirts for this project. I started by grabbing three sections of the luau skirt and I just started doing a simple three strand braid until I got to the end. When I was at the end, I just secured it with some clear tape and I did go across the whole skirt doing this. By the time I got to the end of my skirt, um, there was only one section of the raffia type material left, so that worked out perfectly. Because this is a plastic planter, I wanted to rough up the surface a bit before I started adding my braids to it. I'm just using a regular sanding block here and I'm just taking it over the surface just to take the shine off and to give it a bit of grip so that my hot glue will stick better. I'm using a piece of clear tape again at the top of my braid just to hold the strands in place so that when I cut it off of the rope they don't fray everywhere. And because my planter is kind of large, this braid didn't fit the whole way around it and that was okay. I knew I would be able to cover it up later. I started at the bottom, I added a dab of hot glue, glued one end of my braid down and then I added dabs here and there. I didn't put a whole line down because I didn't want a lot of the glue to seep through the braid. Um, once I got to the other end, then I secured that end down and you can see that there is a big gap between the two ends, but like I said, I'm going to cover that up later. I continued laying the braids down until I reached the top of my container and my last braid just went slightly above the container which was okay because I did want to hide the top of the container so you couldn't see much of that gray color. And that's another tip I have. When I was picking out my container I tried to pick a color that even if you saw some of the container between the braids it wouldn't be very noticeable. Like if I would have picked a bright blue container you probably would have noticed it more than the little bit of gray sticking out between the braids. Now to fill in the gap where the ends of my braids didn't quite meet each other, I'm taking the same braids but I'm running them vertically along the planter. So on the ends of the planter where they're taped together, you can see because they're pinched, there's a lot of gray showing. So I started my first braid about an inch and a half over from the one end. I hot glued it to the top. I held it in place with a clip, ran a little more hot glue, and then I glued the bottom down. Because these braids were a nice length, I was actually able to get two vertical rows out of each braid. On the bottom of the planner, when I secured it with some hot glue, I just made sure that I held it in place and flattened it out with my silicone spatula, just so that it wouldn't be bulky on one side. And the clips really came in handy to hold the top of the braids in place while I was working towards the bottom. And I did the same thing. I just repeated the same process, taping the top of the braid before I cut it and then laying the braids vertically along the planter. So I guess, Depending on what size planter you have, you probably could have reached the braids the whole way around horizontally on the planter if you had a smaller one. Or if you really like the look of the vertical braids, you could have laid the braids vertical the whole way around the container as well. It's really up to you depending on what your taste is. I kind of like that they go in two different directions. I think it gives it a little more character and a little more interest than the Kirkland's version. With Easter around the corner, I wanted to use one of my wood rounds to create an Easter sign. I grabbed one of these wooden beef wreath forms from the Dollar Tree, a little bunny pick, some ribbon, and a couple spring florals as well. 
I started by giving my wood round a quick coat of antique wax. I applied it with a baby wipe. I always like to do this because the wet wipes do two things. They apply the wax and they also take off the excess. After I had applied all of the wax to the front of the wood round, I <laughs> bumped my jar and dumped it all over <laughs> it again. So I poured what I could back into the jar. I dumped the excess back out onto my work surface and I stained the back too. You probably don't have to stain both sides, but since I kind of made a boo-boo and got wax everywhere, I went ahead and just did both sides of mine. I didn't stain the beads that were on the wreath form because I wanted a nice contrast between the beads and the wood round. I wanted to decorate it up a bit, so I grabbed some pastel colored ribbon. I folded it into a loop until I like the width of it. I cinched it in the center and tied it with some jute twine. Once that was in place, I took another small piece of the same ribbon, folded it into thirds, and glued it around the center to give it a finished look. I didn't care for the little bow that was on the bottom of the bunny pick, so I pulled that off and I grabbed some pink gingham ribbon out of my stash. I cut a small piece and I just tied a knot in the center. After I dovetailed the ends, it looked like a bow tie and I used a little hot glue to glue that onto the bottom of my bunny. Before hot gluing my bunny to the center of my bow, I added a few florals on the back side so that it would look like it was sticking out from behind the bunny. Once I had those florals in place, then I hot glued the bunny to the center of the bow and I grabbed a couple more little spring type picks and tucked those in around the bunny as well. Then the last step I needed to do was just hot glue the bow and the bunny to the bottom of the wooden bead wreath form. Before I attached my wooden bead wreath form to the wood round, I grabbed another piece of that same ribbon and I looped it through the top of the wood bead wreath and I cinched it together towards the top and tied it in place with some jute string. I dovetailed the ends so that they would have some fun points on them. And then rather than stressing myself out with trying to center the wood bead wreath into the center of the wood round, I glued it to the top of the wood round, leaving about an inch gap at the top and a little bit of a bigger space on the bottom. To make sure that the wreath form would stay secure on the wood round, I added a bit of hot glue on some of the bottom beads and stuck it to the wood round. Now, I think this looks cute just as it is, but if you wanted a few alternatives, I had this letter M in my stash, which is what my last name starts with, and I also have a Cricut, so I decided to cut a decal out with my Cricut that says Happy Easter, and I just applied that to the gap in the center, but like I said, I think it looks cute without anything in it. This just gives it a little extra embellishment. I like the simplicity of this framed print from Kirkland's and I knew with a few items I could give it more character and more texture. I found this really large frame at the thrift store. This measures about 16 inches by 26 inches. I liked that it has an inset in the middle and there was no glass for me to deal with. I started by giving that inset portion a thick coat of green chalk paint. While that was drying, I grabbed a pack of these giant craft sticks and a pack of the Super Jumbo craft sticks. Both of these I get at Walmart. You can see the size difference here and both of them are much larger than the typical tongue depressor size craft stick. If you're using a smaller frame, you could definitely use some of the smaller craft sticks to get the same look, but because my frame was pretty large, I stuck with the bigger craft sticks. I also laid my cutting mat out and I laid a piece of blue tape where uh, the width of my frame would be. So that would give me a guide as I'm laying out my craft sticks about how big the surface was that I had to work with. I started with the giant craft sticks first. These are the bigger of the two craft sticks and I always like to use my paper trimmer anytime I'm cutting down craft sticks because it just gives me the most even cut. I really can't give you many measurements here because depending on what size frame you use, you'll have to use your judgment as to what size you need to cut your craft sticks down to. I started with the largest ones. I cut a bunch of them and I started laying my craft sticks down under my paper trimmer on the surface that I had taped out. If you don't have a big cutting mat like I do, you could just measure out the surface you're working with and lay out a little box using some painter's tape just so you have an idea of how many sticks you're 
actually going to need to cut down. And then that way you're not gluing them as you're cutting them. So you can play around with the layout. I use the Kirkland's photo as my inspiration for most of the layout. I did have to add in a bit at the bottom. So once I had some of my craft sticks cut, then I started laying them out on my craft mat there, giving me an idea of how many sticks I would need and what lengths I would need to cut them to. And because they were down there on my work surface, I was able to just cut a few sticks at a time, work on the layout as I liked it, go back, use my paper trimmer, cut a bit more craft sticks. And it gave me a better idea of the spacing that I would need for each section of my craft sticks. And I did try to as I was working through the different sections of the craft sticks I tried to make sure that they were going in different directions and I was using both sizes of craft sticks so that I wouldn't have all of the big ones on one side and all of the small ones on one side it, it kind of gave it more character and more texture the the more that I variated the sizes and the directions of the craft sticks once I had the pattern all laid out how I liked it, then I went through with some white chalk paint and I just dry brushed all over the surface of each of the craft sticks. I didn't mind if a little paint got on my cutting mat, so it was easier to do it this way just to pick up each stick individually, do my dry brushing, and lay it back down where it belonged. That way I didn't lose where my pattern was going to be. If you're worried about getting paint on whatever surface you're using, I would just lay out your pattern how you like it and then take a picture of it so that you can refer back to it so that you know where you need to lay each stick on your picture frame. Now that all of my sticks have been cut and dry brushed, I could reassemble my photo frame. I started by gathering up each pile of sticks according to size and I laid the pile of sticks down on my surface in the direction that they needed to go. Once all of my sticks were laid back down in their pattern, then I started using some hot glue to glue everything in place. For each group of sticks, I would start at one end, hot glue that end stick down first, then I would move to the other end of the group and glue that stick in place. Then the sticks that were in the middle of the group, I would glue down from each end working towards the middle. That way I could adjust the gaps of the sticks as I was working towards the middle. I didn't mind if the gaps weren't exactly the same throughout the sticks because I did like that there would be a little more green showing through some of the sticks and it did give it more texture that way. I really like how this piece turned out. I'm always looking for ways to create bigger pieces of decor. Sometimes I think, you know, as crafters, we kind of get stuck in a rut where we feel like we're making the same things over and over again. So it was really fun for me to go to the thrift store and find this frame. It was perfect for what I needed it for and I'm really glad to have a nice big piece of home decor in my home now. I have several packs of these bamboo rings in my stash and in one of the packs I had used the big one but I still had the small one to use up. So in addition to that I grabbed one of these larger palettes that I got from a Dollar Tree Plus section and I'm going to use some macrame cord and some florals. I started by cutting six inch pieces of the macrame cord. I wasn't sure how many pieces I would need in total so I would cut about a dozen at a time and just go from there. I took one of the six inch pieces of cord, I folded it in half, I fed the loop end of that piece through the ring and then I pulled the two ends through that loop and pulled it tight. So it formed a slip knot around the bamboo ring. Now you can see here that the cord is kind of sticking straight up from the ring which is what I wanted it to do because once I had the ring full of all of these six inch pieces of cord, I could smash it down and the ends of the cord would flare out from the ring. Now that all my cords are on my hoop, I just laid it flat on my work surface and flared all those little rope ends out. I used some hot glue on the underside of the ring to attach it to my palette. 
I didn't feel the need to stain or paint my palette. I liked the wood grain that was showing through on it and I really liked the lightness and brightness of the cord with the lighter wood of the palette. But this is where you could customize it to fit your style. You could stain or paint the palette any color you wanted or you could leave it plain and switch up the color of cord that you use to tie onto the ring. I wanted to keep the embellishment simple for this wreath because I really liked the flared look of the rope around the ring. So I grabbed two pieces of greenery out of my stash. I hot glued the two stems together and I used a piece of clear tape just to secure it. And I curved the stems just a bit so it would match the curve of the ring. Then I took some thicker jute cord. This is the one I get from Walmart. It's a bit thicker than the one you can find at the Dollar Tree. I tied it around one end of the center of the two pieces of greenery and I wrapped it around the center several times so that it would have a nice thick chunky look in the center. And then I just needed to hot glue it to the base of the wreath. To complete this project, I used another length of that same macrame cord and I hot glued it on the back at the top to use as a hanger. I always like to secure my cords with tape also. It just adds an extra layer of security. I wanted to create a wreath for my front door that has a coastal theme to it. I picked up one of these wooden wreath forms from the Dollar Tree, some of the nautical rope, and I have some of this macrame cord that I get from Amazon. It comes in a really big spool. I'll make sure that it's linked in the description box below. I started by cutting my macrame cord down to eight inch pieces. I found it easier to start with a 16 inch piece, fold it in half, and then cut it down to the eight inch length. Once I had a pretty big pile of those eight inch pieces cut, I started by taking one of them, folding it in half, pulling the loop through the center of the wreath base, and then pulling the ends through that loop. That creates a slip knot around the wreath base, and I just continued doing that until I had the entire wooden ring full of the slip knots of the macrame cord. As I continued filling up the wreath form with the knots, I just made sure that every time I added a new piece of cord, I went in from the same side so that all of the knot side of the two strings would be on the same side, if that makes any sense. I wanted to make sure that the indentation side of the knots was always facing upward towards me. After the wooden ring was completely filled with the knots, then I went in through with that nautical rope. This is the blue and white twisted nautical rope. They do sell regular jute colored nautical rope at the Dollar Tree too, but I like this one because it fits in with that coastal theme. And I just ran a bead of hot glue along the indentation side of those knots and I covered that little space up with the rope. I think this wreath looks good as is with just the rope around the center, but I wanted to add a few embellishments to mine. I grabbed a few picks of greenery, a few pieces of ribbon, and some seashells. Most of these things I got from the Dollar Tree. I wanted to keep mine a little simple, so I kept most of the decorations towards the bottom of my wreath, but this is where you could let your style kind of come into play, and you could add shells the whole way around, or add different types of bows or greenery, Whatever you like, this is the perfect base to decorate with. These faux church windows are such a trend in home decor and I knew that the Dollar Tree had something similar. The ones from the Dollar Tree are a bit smaller than the Kirkland's one, so I grabbed two. One I used in a previous project. I also had this flower ring left over that I had pulled some of the flowers off of and so I'm just going to use the ring part. Now you can see on the one church window it had some glue and some sticks on it because like I said it was from a previous project. So I took the brand new one and I'm using 
my miter shears here. These cut through a lot of things. There, I can cut through dowel rods, and I knew that I would be able to cut through this plastic frame with these miter shears as well. I took the miter shears and I clipped off just the bottom section of the church window. I tried to cut it right above the bar so that I would have something to glue onto the top window. I did have to use my little scraper to remove the piece of glue that was holding the sign on the front and I had to do the same thing with the previous one as well. Once I had it um, cut down to the size I then took my sanding block and I did sand the surface a bit to give it some grip and texture and I also sanded the bottom of the other window as well. I added a bead of hot glue to the bottom of the full window and added the second piece onto it. Once those were stuck together, I flipped them over and I added more hot glue on the back over the seam of the two windows just to make it more secure. Next, I got to work on creating the wreath for the center of the window. I had this ring, it was left over from Christmas time. I think it was meant to go around a candle. I had pulled off some of the flowers that were on it and I was just left with a few random leaves so I pulled all those off and then clipped off the extra plastic pieces. Next, I dug through my big bag of loose greenery. I pulled out a bunch of branches. I had these ones, I think they came on um, a mat, you know, like a mat of greenery. And they, they had like four prongs sticking up from the bottom. So when I cut them in half, they fit over the ring really perfectly. So I cut a bunch of them in half and I'm just gluing them the whole way around the ring to make them nice and full. Once I had all of those in place, then I added in a few white flowers as well, just to break up some of that green. If you don't have one of these plastic rings from an old candle wreath like I do, you could use just a piece of cardboard. I would just cut a circle out, maybe give it a quick coat of green paint so that if any of it peeks through your greenery, you won't be able to see it. Or you could use an old lid from say a cottage cheese container or a butter container, just cut out the center and then do the same thing. Maybe give it a quick coat of green paint just so that if you do see it through some of your greenery or some of your flowers, you won't be able to notice it. To finish off this project, I just needed to hot glue my wreath to the center of my window. Now the Kirkland's window did have a rope hanger from the top, but this Dollar Tree window actually had a small hook on the back of it, so I didn't need to add the rope to mine. looking for more storage in my house and reusing cardboard boxes is a great way to do that. I took one cardboard box, some of this white nautical rope from the Dollar Tree, and I actually found this piece of fabric at Joanne Fabrics. It was on the remnant cart and I really liked the coastal print on it. I started by taking my box flaps and hot gluing them to the inside of the box. I used some clips to hold them into place while the glue set. I like doing it this way because I feel like it gives more sturdiness to the sides of the box. After I had the two longer sides of the box glued into place, before I glued the shorter sides inward, I just cut a small triangle off of each side so that when I folded the side flap in, there it wasn't rubbing up against the other flaps and it took some of that bulk out. I can't really give you any kind of measurements for the material because it's all gonna be based on how big your box is. For my box, I laid my box on top of my material and I made sure that when I folded the material up over all four sides, it completely covered all of the inside of the box and went down into the bottom of the box. I wasn't worried about some of the bottom showing through because I am gonna create another panel to slip down inside. I just wanted to make sure that all of my sides would be covered with material. When I added my hot glue, I made sure that I was only adding hot glue on the inside of the box. This is pretty thick material but I was still afraid that some of the glue would ooze out through and you would be able to see it from the outside. So I just made sure that all of my hot glue stayed towards the inside. 
Once I had my two longest sides glued into place, I started working on the shorter sides. And as I was folding the material up, I would kind of pinch it with my hands where there would be some excess so that I could cut it away and it wouldn't be so bulky once I folded it up. After I had some of the excess cut away, then I could just pleat the material as neat as I could and fold it up over the edges and then hot glue it into place. Because you could still see some of that cardboard through the bottom of the box, I wanted to create another panel that I could just slip down inside. I cut a piece of chipboard down to fit inside of my box and I took another piece of that material and I just covered one side of the chipboard with the material. I did the same thing where I would glue both of the longer sides in. I would cut out a little bit of excess material just to make sure there was no bulk in there before I folded the shorter side sides towards the middle of the chipboard. Once the whole panel was covered in that material, then I could just slide it right into the bottom of my box and you didn't see any more cardboard. I wanted to keep the decorations on this box pretty simple because it does have a pretty busy print. I started with two lengths of the nautical rope that I folded in half and I laid one piece of rope out so that the loop was facing to the right. I took the other length of rope and I pulled the two ends through the loop and then once the loop was almost the whole way through I pulled the ends of the left loop through the second loop. I know that seems a little complicated. I'm going to do it a second time so you can watch it again, but it's pretty easy and it creates a pretty simple knot. Of course, you don't have to do this knot at all. You could just create a regular bow with the rope and I think that would look cute too. Once I had my knot tied, then I took the longer side of the box and I hot glued the knot into place first. I went around all of the edges and I just added hot glue on the corners because I didn't want to run the risk of any of the hot glue seeping through the rope and you being able to see it through the ropes. So I would just add a little bit on the corners as I was going around and pulling it tight. Once I got to the back side, I cut the excess length of rope off and I added some hot glue and pinched the ends together. I knew that I would keep this box where you wouldn't see those unfinished ed edges, but if that's something that bother you, you could always cover that up with another piece of decoration. I've had these two winter tags in my stash for a while and I figured they would look really good layered on a wood round. Now this one's from the Dollar Tree so it's a little bit smaller than the other ones but it still works for a great sign. I started by giving the wood round a base coat of white chalk paint. Then I moved on to the two tags. I gave one a base coat of some teal colored paint and the other one I had to give two coats of yellow chalk paint. After my paint was dry, I started creating stripes on the wood round. I'm using painter's tape. I laid a piece down, then I laid a smaller piece down to act as a spacer, and then I placed my next piece of painter's tape. I did this the whole way across until I had stripes going across the surface of the wood round. Once all of my tape was in place, I went back in with that same teal color that I painted the tag with, and I did a heavy dry brushing all over the surface to create some distressed looking stripes. I wanted to create smaller stripes in between the bigger ones, so I'm using some thinner washi tape. After my stripes were good and dry, I placed the washi tape on either side of the stripes to create a smaller center stripe. Once all of the tape was in place, then I went through with the yellow color that I painted on the other tag and I painted my second set of stripes. On the teal tag, I wanted to create the, some polka dots, so I'm using a pencil eraser dipped in some white chalk paint and I just started placing larger polka dots all over the tag. Once I had all of the larger polka dots in place, I went back through with a dotting tool and I dipped it in the same white paint and created smaller polka dots in between the larger ones. To add a bit of texture to the yellow tag, I'm using a stencil brush or a chippy brush and I'm just dipping it in some white chalk paint and dry brushing it all over the edges to give it a distressed look. Also on the yellow tag, I created a decal using my Cricut with a little birdhouse that says welcome and applied that to the front of the tag. There were already two holes at the top of this wood round, which I'm going to use as the hanger for my sign. I added a bit of hot glue to the end of a piece of jute cord, fished it through, and tied a knot on the front of the sign. 
Then I did the same thing on the other end of the jute cord and I strung on a few of these black wooden beads that I had in my stash because I thought the black beads would coordinate well with the black decal that I added to the front of the yellow tag. Once I had all of the beads on the jute string, then I just had to run the other end of the jute through the other hole at the top, tie another knot, and cut off the excess. I didn't like that you could still see the holes at the top of my tags, so I grabbed some black ribbon out of my stash. I cut a small piece, tied a knot in the center, dovetailed the ends to create that faux bow tie look that I love so much, and I hot glued a little bow tie to the top of each tag. I layered one tag on top of the other and fastened them together using some hot glue. Then I flipped both tags over and I cut a few pieces of craft stick to fill in the gap where the one tag was on top of the other so that when I went to attach them to the wood round it would be a nice flat surface to glue them onto. To complete this sign, I added a generous amount of hot glue to the back of the two tags and then I placed it in the center of the wood round. the Dollar Tree always has different types of wooden houses out for the different seasons and the different holidays. I have a ton of them so I grabbed three that I thought would look nice grouped together. I'm also going to use one of these adhesive cork sheets that you can find in the crafter square section. For the first house it had a few little pieces on it that's just a foam sand dollar. I was able to get that off pretty easily. I didn't mind this roof piece so much. I didn't really care for the color and I figured if I pulled it off, it would be easier to apply the cork sheet if it wasn't on there. And it actually came off pretty easy just using my scraper tool. I did have to sand it down a bit and once I got the piece off, there were actually a few little nails I guess they're nails, maybe staples, I don't know, sticking up, but I was able to push those down flat with just a pair of pliers. I cut a piece of the cork sheet down so that it was just slightly bigger than the house itself. It does have an adhesive back to it, but I did run hot glue around the edges just for a bit of extra hold. Now because the lines on this house are so simple, once I had that cork sheet in place, I was able to flip it over and using my utility knife, I could just run it along those edges and cut off all the excess. Like I mentioned, I didn't care for the color of the little roof piece that was on this house, but that was a quick fix. I just gave it a quick coat of white chalk paint. I didn't love the pattern that was on the inside of this medium sized house. With these houses, I've noticed it's pretty easy just to pop the back side of them off. I took it off and removed some of the excess paper. I gave it a sanding here and there where there was a little paper sticking out. And then I liked the frame itself, so I just added a quick dry brush of some white paint all around the edges of this house. I got lucky with the back of this house because when I flipped it over, it still lined up with the frame okay. Sometimes they're a little off and it doesn't quite work out that way, but this time it worked in my favor. So I gave it one quick coat of white chalk paint. I wanted to add just a simple ticking stripe to the one side of this house. I started with a piece of painter's tape and I laid it down, then I laid it two more pieces on either side and pulled up that original centerpiece that I had put down first. I gave that one coat of green chalk paint and pulled the tape up right away. But I had to make sure that this paint was really, really dry before I moved on to the next two stripes. Once my paint was nice and dry, then I used that same painter's tape and I overlapped that stripe that I had just painted and I laid another piece down so that it basically created a pinstripe on either side of the big stripe. And then once I had all of that painter's tape in place, I was able to paint those thinner stripes with the same green color. Now I needed to get these houses put back together. I used some hot glue. I ran it along the edges of the backing for the framed house. I attached the frame and then I used some hot glue on the roof piece for the cork house and just glued that in place as well. You could leave these houses separate and just group them together wherever you're going to display them, but I decided to keep mine together, so I did run some hot glue along the back of the framed house and hot glue it right to 
the cork house. Now for the smallest house, this is a picture frame. So I didn't want to glue this one onto the other two because I wanted access to change out the picture, but I didn't need the little kickstand that came with it. So that was pretty easy to pop off. And then because I do plan on putting a picture of my dogs in this little house, I did cut a paw print out with my Cricut and applied it right to the top of this frame. I had this idea in my head that I wanted to create an over the door hanger with the beach feel. I grabbed one of the over the door hangers from the Dollar Tree along with this long plank sign. This wooden sign from the Dollar Tree already has the grooves in it to make it look like three separate planks, which I love, but you could use one of the solid signs too. Now, because this sign already had two holes on one end, I decided to create two more holes on the other end using my crocodile. This is a really cool tool. I use it a lot in my craft room for punching through these Dollar Tree signs. It works good on chipboard, cardboard. I've even punched through bottle caps with it before. So I'll make sure I have this linked in the description box below for you if you're interested in it. Next I got to work painting my sign. I'm using some white chalk paint here with a chalk brush and I'm doing a heavy dry brushing over the whole sign concentrating more of the paint on the edges but I didn't want to see a whole lot of that wood color through so I am doing it pretty heavy through the center as well. Now while I'm painting this I'm going to be real honest with you and this project did not turn out how I expected it to but I wanted to leave it in here and explain to you what happened, what went wrong, what I didn't think through in the first place and how I had to change it to to make it work because sometimes I know people can get frustrated when they're crafting that things aren't always turning out but there's almost always a way to fix whatever you're working on so a little bit later in the project you'll see where things kind of went wrong with this project and what I did to fix it once my paint was dry, then I wanted to attach my over the door hanger to my sign. And this is where things went wrong, but I didn't realize it at first. So I started by using a combination of the E6000 glue and some hot glue to make sure that my over the door hanger would hanger would stick to my sign. It would have that long-term hold of the E6000 and the short-term hold of the hot glue. And some of you probably already can see why this project didn't work out because the over the door hanger the over the door part is not at the top of my sign it's in the middle of my sign so after i had this entire thing finished and i hung it on the door to take a picture of it the the sign part of it the plank part hung up over the top of my door so i could not close my door <laughs> with the sign where it was on this hanger. But like I said, I ended up fixing it in the end so that I could use this as a decorative hanger somewhere else in my house. And I'll get into that a little bit later and explain how I fixed all of that. Back on the front side of my hanger, I'm using two packs of those starfish that you can find at the Dollar Tree and I'm hot gluing one above each of the hooks. I had to stagger these out a little bit so that they would all fit, which I thought actually gave the hanger a little more character and made it look really cute. So I would hot glue one of the starfish down lower on the sign and then I would hot glue the second one up a little bit higher so it created a little bit of a zigzag pattern across the front of the sign. To cover up the holes on either side of the sign, I'm creating a nautical knot for each end. I took two lengths of jute cord and folded it in half. I faced one one of the loops of jute cord to the right and I tucked the ends of the second piece through that loop. Once I had the loop pulled almost the whole way through, then I picked up the ends of the first one and pulled it through the first loop. You don't have to go through this kind of complicated knot if you don't want to. You could just create a regular knot or just wrap jute cord around each end. After my knot was in place, then I fished the ends of the jute cord through each of the holes and I made sure that the knot was centered on the front of the sign. I added some hot glue to the back to secure it in place. I cut down a few pieces of felt to fit on the back of my hanger so that I could cover up some of those raw edges and they wouldn't scratch any surface that they would be laying on. Once I had a piece of the felt glued in the center, then I kind of marked with my fingers where that hook would have to come through so that I could poke it through that felt and then continue gluing it down. Now, because I ended up not being able to hang this over the door, 
if you would break off those hooks to start with, you wouldn't have to worry about this step. So my recommendation to you is you can still make this work. I still have a really pretty hanger that I can hang things on and I love it. But I would take that over the door part and I would bend it back and forth quite a few times. And this metal is thin enough that that hook will just break off so that you can use this as a flat hanging piece rather than an over the door piece. I hope that makes sense to you. I wasn't able to break my hooks off because I already had all of this felt and everything into place so I couldn't bend those hooks back and forth to break them off. So what I ended up doing in the end was flattening these hooks out as much as I could so that they could lay flat against the sign as well. You can see once I had that metal piece flattened out, I just added a bunch of hot glue over top of it and then another piece of felt so that it would be covered up. Now the problem is how do I hang this? So I cut a piece of the felt out on each end of the sign. I added in one of the tumbling tower blocks from the Dollar Tree and then on top of that I added a sawtooth hanger so that I could hang this up and still use it. I wanted to leave all this in for you to see because I don't want you to get discouraged when you're crafting. It's supposed to be fun. We all make mistakes, but there's usually a way that we can make it work and still make something beautiful. Thanks so much for coming to hang out with me again today. I always love to hear from you in the comments, so let me know how your winter is going so far. All right, everyone, have a great week, and I'll talk to you in the next one.